talk about risk here in the United States. Let's take a look at what's happening. Perhaps the most exciting story in macroeconomics today uh, is the experiment that we call Abenomics, the uh, effort to try and restart the Japanese economy after 20 years of stagnation with a variety of uh, creative proposals. And just to summarize, um, uh, Professor Abe has talked about three arrows of using fiscal policy, more aggressive monetary policy, and structural reform to get the economy going again. So the first, what I'd like to really start off with is just doing a sort of an interim report card and see how it's doing. And let me start with you, Paul. Is Abenomics working? Uh, thanks, Greg. Well, I think so far, it, you know, it is working. It's off to a very, very good start. Um, and just on Abenomics, I think it is worth just sort of focusing on what is Abenomics. You described it as the three arrows, I which it is. But I tend to describe it as kind of two pillars. One pillar being macro policy being used to end deflation. And the second po uh, pillar being uh, supply side reforms aimed at raising real growth. So I think it's e useful to separate them out and think in those two ways. Uh, and you know, the Bank of Japan obviously is taking the lead on the macro policy, uh, but it's a very important shift at the Bank of Japan. Uh, but it can be separated a little bit from the structural reform agenda. I think we need to look at it in two different contexts. Professor Hamada, let me ask, uh, ask you, is it working? Yes, uh, indeed, particularly the macroeconomic part and more uh, specifically the monetary policy part. When Mr. Shinzo Abe started his campaign uh, last November, uh, Japanese deflation gap, that is the excess capacity ratio to GDP, was uh, about 3%. Now it is uh, 1.5% uh, three months ago. And uh, if you look at any newspapers like FT or Wall Street Journal, it's only Japan that have uh, one year yield of 40% or so. So it is uh, very well working in the first pillar. Fiscal policy, I am a Monday Fleming disciple, so I don't put too much emphasis on fiscal policy, but it's working also. The problem is uh, the third arrow or the second pillar of uh, Abenomics. So I, uh, because that needs this robbing or de of uh, armor of uh, bureaucrats, they have authority and power by administrating some <laughs> regulations. But in order to increase I incentive mechanisms, uh, they have to give up. And it is very difficult for bureaucrats to do uh, its own to give up its own power. Well, that's a very interesting point because um, I want to go back to, uh, I think it was in 98, when the Japanese government also brought in the first uh, increase in the consumption tax. And there's a widespread view that Japan fell back in a recession in large part because of the timing of that consumption tax. Are we at risk of repeating history? I mean, um, how, do you, how wise is it for the government to be talking, to, to be ready on the verge of a new uh, tax increase when other things just seem to be finally coming together? Well, uh, uh, obviously that uh, the memory is, is echoing down through history of the 1997 tax hike. Now, the circumstances are very different, Greg, yeah. uh, because of course Japan was, uh, had not really hardly begun to recognize the depths of the uh, problems in the banking system, and you had the Asian crisis. So the consumption tax and other fiscal consolidation that took place in 1997, it wasn't just the consumption tax hike, there was a whole lot of piling on of fiscal cons cons consolidation. It was a spectacularly bad timing to be doing that. Um, so I think the circumstances are, are different. The economy is in much better condition to withstand uh, fiscal tightening. However, if you were to ask me, is that the right thing to be doing? Um, personally, speaking as an economist, not as an S&P sovereign analyst, I should say, um, I do struggle with this because the cornerstone, as I said, of Abenomics, the most important, in some sense, low-hanging fruit, 
is Japan's opportunity to end deflation once and for all. Deflation has been going on for 15 to almost 20 years, depending on how you measure it. Um, now, there's also the structural reform agenda, but of course, Japan has a long history of talking about and doing various structural reforms, but that's a slow-moving uh, slow machine. The thing that they can really get a win on here is to end deflation. And if we go to the second arrow, the second arrow talks about flexible, which is a euphemism for more uh, supportive fiscal policy for two to three years. So I do question the wisdom of putting your foot, the Bank of Japan, to its credit, is really slamming its foot uh, on the monetary accelerator. But here we go again with the fiscal authorities starting to put their foot on the fiscal brakes. I don't think that's the optimal macro policy mix to end deflation once and for all. Because, Greg, policymakers in Japan have talked about doing this before. They've uh, had a lot of uh, Koizumi era in particular, and they didn't deliver. So I do think it's really, really important to execute policy well this time. And I wouldn't personally be taking the chance of having a fiscal consolidation just in the sort of uh, kind of launch point of trying to end deflation. D Professor Hamada, do you think that this, con that this fiscal consolidation, uh, you, you've talked about cognitive capture at the Ministry of Finance and almost sort of ideological obsession with fiscal consolidation. Do you see a high risk that this obsession will completely frustrate and undo all the positive, all the more positive stimulative efforts of the Bank of Japan? Uh, I think the, still the Japanese economy has 1.5% uh, deflation gap, uh, excess capacity, and that can go to minus 1% or so. It, I felt and I opposed the, this rather big 3% move, uh, not so common in other countries. So, have, so I am a little bit worried, but at the same time, I... So you are terribly worried or you're not? Uh, I am worried uh, about the negative impact of consumption tax. However, the situation is completely different because monetary policy is uh, ready to accommodate any lack of uh, effective demand, and Mr. Kuroda is a true believer of the efficacy of monetary policy. So I hope combination of some fiscal expenditures and uh, bold monetary policy will make Japan to go over the hurdle of consumption tax, in the sense I agree with Paul. So uh, I think that if you go back to some of the criticisms and recommendations that people like Paul Krugman and Ben Bernanke were making vis-a-vis -vis the Japanese uh, policy mix as long as, as much as a decade ago, they talked about the need to commit to be irresponsible, that the Bank of Japan needed to make an irrevocable and highly credible commitment to get the price level and inflation up. And basic economics tells us that the test of that is whether people's expectations have changed. Are people now expecting positive inflation instead of deflation? And that is the key to getting real rates down and more negative. On that very narrow uh, test, mm. is the Bank of Japan succeeding? Have they started to defeat the deflationary psychology that has locked them in this low growth trap? Well, I, I, think, I think it's starting to succeed. Definitely that we're seeing signs of that. Some of the inflation expectation measures, both market-based and some of the survey measures, definitely point, pointing in, in that direction. But I do think uh, you know, there's a question of some of the reliability of those measures, and it's far too early to, to, to declare victory. But if I could just um, make one point in that context, that question, Greg, which is, I think, extremely important to understand, is that there has been a dramatic shift in the messaging uh, uh, and, and the policy that's coming out of the Bank of Japan, having moved from Governor Shirakawa to Governor Kuroda. Because under Governor Shirakawa in particular, but even previous governors, but Governor Shirakawa really put this view out there very strongly that the cause of deflation in Japan was not insufficiently aggressive monetary policy. Rather, it was falling real potential growth. Therefore, the solution the way to end deflation, in his mind, was not aggressive monetary policy of the kind we're seeing now under Governor Kuroda, but rather putting pressure on the government to push ahead with structural reform. The problem with that argument is, or that, that view is, of course, that it's, it's self-defeating. Uh, and it's essentially rejected the idea, the core idea of inflation targeting, which is that the central bank can operate 
directly on the inflation expectations of the public and anchor those expectations. Now, Go Governor Kuroda believes in that theory, and so he is trying to work directly on the public's expectations. And of course, that has to be backed up with some sort of monetary action, which again has been quite sweeping and quite bold. So even before getting to the point of how much is it working, I think, I think the most significant fact is the Bank of Japan has crossed that kind of intellectual Rubicon, and hopefully there's no turning back. So my view, Greg, is it should work. I believe it can work. I think it should work. But perhaps we'll discuss in more detail in the rest of the panel. You know, I'm still net not a complete believer in terms of saying, yes, uh, it's going to work. But we go ahead and tell us now why there is that residual skepticism on your part. Well, it, 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 a couple of reasons. Um, one is simply the fact that uh, I don't think it's going to be that easy to essentially what the Bank of Japan has, has to do is dislodge deflation expectations that have been you know, anchored around a, minor, a mild deflation for 15 years, dislodge them, raise them 2.5%, and then re-anchor them. That actually has never been done in history. Mr. Volcker did the equivalent of taking very high inflation and inflation expectations, squeezing them out of the sister system and re-anchoring it you know, at a lower level. So this would be a sort of historic first. And I think it's going, to, it's just going to take a lot of policy heft here. And one of the reasons is that, the, as I mentioned before, the Bank of Japan itself um, has been the principal voice in the economy telling people for years that deflation is not a monetary phenomenon. So it's all very well for Mr. Kuroda, correctly in my view, to say that, well, it kind of is and we can do something about it. But um, it's a little bit confusing for the public to get this kind of, this different message. Another reason is simply if we look into the content, I mean, I do agree that the, it's a very bold action, but to a large extent, the Bank of Japan is playing sort of balance sheet catch up. I'll give you some numbers there. When Governor Shirakawa stepped down, the Bank of Japan had expanded its balance sheet by about 54% relative to the financial crisis. The Fed was already at you know, 250, Bank of England 333%, the ECB was around about 90% or so. So by the end of 2014, the Bank of Japan will have expanded its balance sheet by about 165%. That's great, but the Fed's at 330%. Now that's not the only metric, and we could argue about what's the right metric, but they're sort of coming late to the party. And secondly, in terms of the content, um, essentially the Bank of Japan is doing what I would call plain vanilla quantitative easing. That is, they're going out and buying a whole lot of government bonds and they're providing bank reserves. At the zero bound, when you've been stuck in deflation and a liquidity trap for so long, that portfolio substitution or rebalance effect that you get from uh, essentially providing reserves to buy very low yielding government debt, essentially substituting one form of government debt for another, doesn't have very much quantitative easing bang for the buck or bang for the yen. So I think that the Bank of Japan maybe will have to do something a little bit more bolder. And maybe they're prepared to, we just haven't seen that yet. Uh, Professor Hamad, I'd like your view. Now, of course, you may not have, you may struggle to be unbiased because, of course, you have advised uh, Governor Kuroda on some of these strategies that they're pursuing. But um, here we are, we're approximately six to eight months, about a year actually, into this, this new regime. And what is the evidence that they have succeeded in dislodging the deflationary mindset? And do you believe that the different approach of Governor Kuroda has actually marked a regime shift that will change the outcome of this policy versus those of its predecessors? Uh, I think uh, I gave you A, B, E to the three pillars of Abenomics. Monetary policy is very well done, so I give Kuroda a son as well, A plus. Fiscal policy, I am still Mandarian, so uh, it's not so important as a monetary policy, so it's B. And for the last pillar, it's not C, but very unpredictable. Uh, the third pillar is writing some blueprint, what kind of technology may descend from heaven, and uh, then the Japanese will grow up, and so forth. Uh, what government can do is only deregulate, uh, reduce uh, corporate tax rate, to make private incentive to act better. 
but uh, recent uh, thing occurring in several committees is a very strong bureaucratic resistance against labor reform, special uh, economic zone reforms, and so forth. So uh, I cannot give uh, even C or D to the third pillar. So I have to give E, not, if not F. So the total uh, grading is a, a, B, E for the abenomics. Uh, that's uh, my position. And about the inflationary expectation, I have a slightly different view. It's a very complicated matter. We are in, the Japanese are in Keynesian liquidity trap. So in order to unlock this money holding, you have to enhance the expectations. And that part is well understood. But in the supply side, in the firms and so forth. Uh, I'm also so a student. Uh, my dissertation advisor is Edmund Phelps. So he emphasized the role of expectations in Philips Cup. And price expectation goes up too fast in that field that will have uh, undesirable effect in the supply side. And of course, different people are engaging in the expectation. Maybe different, but we cannot manipulate in the most favorable way for the government. If I have left some important question, I will go. Yeah, the, well, some of the, if you wanted to be optimistic, you would look at just some of the most recent data out of Japan. And you'd, you could actually be quite encouraged. I think just yesterday we learned that retail sales in Japan were very strong. Yeah. There's lots of anecdotal evidence that people's spirits have lifted. They're out there spending more money. Uh, CPI inflation, I think, is positive. Core inflation in Tokyo and Greater Japan is positive for the first time since 2008. If you wanted to be somewhat more skeptical, you would say that is just simply the near-term consequence of the yen depreciation and the short-term expansionary impulse, and it's going to peter away as it always has in the past. What is the, the right way to look at these? Are these green shoots, or is this just a, fall, a, a head fake, a false if, start? If uh, I answer to your first but I completely agree. If uh, only the stock market is doing fine, it's uh, maybe by imaginary factors mm. or uh, wishful thinking for the future. On the other hand, in the job offer applicant ratio, in addition to other real or in terms of flow, uh, statistics are improving gradually. And that is universal. Okinawa is very slow to growth, uh, but still, abenomics is going to the every corner of. Uh, Japanese island, so I quite agree with you. Yeah, I mean, I, there's no doubt, Greg, that you know, the conditions have improved, the outlook has improved. I mean, uh, Abenomics has been a, a real atmospheric game changer, and it does have some real policy content. Again, I come back to the shift at the Bank of Japan, something that, you know, frankly speaking, long-term Bank of Japan watchers and critics like, like myself never thought uh, we'd live to, see, live to see the day it happened. So, you know, again, an A, uh, an a for that. Um, but we have, by the same token, seen for the long-term Bank of Japan watchers around um, maybe had too many battle scars. We've seen you know, time and time again in the last 20 years where Japanese policymakers have snatched uh, defeat from the jaws of victory. So it's just a little bit, a little bit early. Now, one thing, um, that sort of one thing that I do uh, sort of worry a little bit about, uh, Professor Hamada mentioned the equity market. It's been a very strong tailwind uh, for the government uh, and for Abenomics. Um, there's still a vulnerability there which is that it's really been driven by foreign investors, you know, the kind of people that are in this room. And the statistics are really startling. And again, we've seen this before in previous episodes. Uh, since Prime Minister Noda called the election uh, mid-November last year, and of course then the markets were sniffing Abenomics, foreign investors have been massive net buyers of Jap Japanese equities. They've clocked up uh, 12.4 trillion, which is about 120 billion dollars of, of equities net net, uh, and there's a very strong correlation uh, between when they are net buyers, the equity market goes up, 
when they happen to be net sellers, even small net sellers, the equity market goes down. So here's sort of where the third arrow comes in. Again, I'm not putting much weight on the third arrow. I think the key development is that the Bank of Japan doesn't, everyone wants the third arrow, everyone wants the second pillar. But it's not absolutely necessary to get the, the reflation. You could actually do that pretty much with macro policy. But there is one vulnerability, which is if the sort of folks in this room and investors worldwide get disappointed with the lack of uh, structural reform and supply side reform and start to take their money off the table and say, we've made good profits in Japan, let's unwind this trade. If you haven't had that domestic mind shift to have the increased risk appetite, if you like, the domestic investor portfolio rebalance away from cash towards risk assets, that should logically happen if indeed the economy is coming out of a 20-year deflation, if you don't get that, the market, I think, is very vulnerable to a very sharp sell-off. And again, we've seen this time and time again. So that would be where I'd be focusing on, if I was Prime Minister Abe, on the third arrow of not deflating the expectations, not just of domestic investors, but uh, foreign investors as well. Almost more for its signal value than its substance value. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have lots more that I'd like to talk about, but I'd also like to bring our um, participants into the conversation. If you have a question, could you please uh, raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you right away. Um, while we're waiting for some people to get their, gather their thoughts, let me ask a question that I've been wondering about, which is that um, at least the United States administration, one of their uh, major um, uh, policy initiatives is the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and it was kind of a game changer for that trade initiative when Japan signaled its desire to join. Um, domestically, how important is Trans-Pacific Partnership to the Japanese government, and is it a key vehicle to achieving the supply side reforms of the third arrow? Since other third pillar reforms are very difficult to achieve. Uh, TPP is a very good way of uh, sort of enforcing Japan to ch change. And the uh, problem with TPP is uh, I sometimes meet negotiators and they are doing very seriously, but uh, most of the information the, by the rule it's a secret yeah. negotiation that we don't know. Uh, but I think uh, we, uh, Japanese agriculture is heavily, uh, particularly only the rice and some small items, uh, heavily and very artificially protected. And the Jap Japanese agriculture can be an, an export industry, as uh, Mr. Asakawa, Yoshihiro, and so forth mentioned. Uh, so uh, I think including agriculture, and that should not be in the secret domain, untouchable domain, but it should be liberalized to uh, gradually e to ease the tensions. Uh, yeah, TPP, I think, is very important from one, one perspective, Greg, which, again, is this idea of an atmospheric game changer. Um, the amazing thing about TPP is Trans-Pacific Partnership that probably for the last five years, I mean, every taxi driver, uh, you know, every ordinary uh, sort of uh, person in Japan was steeped in the arts of TPP. I mean, everybody knew what it was. The debate has been building up for years. We've come across to the United States and ask even opinion leaders what you think about TPP. Often they say, what's that? Um, so it has a real sort of symbolic value, and I think Mr. Abe was very right and clever to go out and surprise people by saying, yes, we're gonna embrace this, we're gonna enter. It, you know, who knows when it's gonna happen. When it does happen, it'll, it'll take time for the effects, but the, the effect on domestic psychology, I think, is very, very positive. So again, it's a, it's a, it's a situation where the symbolic value, the willingness to you know, at least talk about some of these sacred cows is as important as what you, in the end, deliver. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope to deliver so. now at yeah, least. I hope you're right because I think that people do need to sort of get their expectations under control a little bit because these trade negotiations are always difficult. We have a, a question uh, over here, I believe. If we could just get a microphone over there. Hi, thank you. My name is Adrian Dixon. Uh, Japan has a huge demographic challenge, which surely must be one of the factors behind uh, deflation. So I was wondering to what extent does economics address that and, and can it help it in any way? Want to the, try the demographic the Daro, uh, has a difficulty, may, and the may, most difficult part is demographic and population changes. The best uh, 
economic solution is to allow immigration, as the U.S. is doing selectively in skilled, as I am beneficiary of skilled immigrants, probably, but U.S. is very clever to do, uh, even with many problems, uh, this policy, but the Japanese culture will revolt against this idea, at least at the present, so it is very difficult. Uh, women is a big element, and it's partly because of regulation and so forth, but the sentiment itself should be changing. I went to Keidan and the business, Japan Business Association, and there were about 40, 50 top executives governing Japan, but there was no women, women in the group and the women, very able, well educated women are doing some kind of no NPO activities in the adjacent rooms. But that picture shows that total sentiment to allow and to encourage women to work uh, is missing. Yeah, I think this is one of the very disappointing uh, aspects uh, of, of the third arrow, or the second pillar, uh, is that there's no, there's no embracing of immigration. Um, the other issue that's really missing is a concerted attempt to really turn around the very low, turn around and raise the, the low fertility rate. And, and I think what Japan needs to do on the labor force participation, there is quite a lot of discussion about uh, pr promoting female labor force participation. Um, but I think what they need to do is do that in a way that also uh, allows the fertility rate to go up. So there's some big changes that need to be made there in terms of um, you know, not just the tax system, but also sort of social policy. Uh, but I would like to see more of a kind of rhetorical focus on that issue. Immigration seems to be off the table. And you know, I lived in Japan for 17 years over a 30-year period. Uh, three quarters of my family are Japanese, I, my two children and my, and my wife. Um, I lived in the center of Tokyo, which is teeming with foreigners. You go around the country, there are actually foreigners all over the place. But the Japanese have got some sort of cultural blinker on where they sort of almost pretend that immigration is not happening. So what is lacking is a sort of sensible, strategic, smart immigration policy. But if you want to turn around real growth, you have to attack the demographics, you have to tap into the labor force. People, Japanese live longer, they should work longer, they should use, utilize the female participation, uh, female workforce, very well educated, very competent, uh, but underutilized. But get the fertility rate up and embrace, in a smart way, immigration. That would be a great message as the third arrow of Abenomics, but it's, it's not quite there yet. Even allowing some uh, Im immigrants in nurse or caretakers, that may free Japanese women to work more. I'd like to sort of finish up this panel by um, asking, by actually bringing back some of the concerns that were raised in my first panel about the efforts by the Federal Reserve to get the United States out of its low growth mode. Um, given what we see now in Japan, what lessons does the Japanese experiment in these new forms of aggressive monetary stimulus have for the rest of the world? Should the rest of the world be looking to Japan for examples of what it should be doing, and if so, what specifically should we be learning from the Japanese experiment? A fixed exchange rate system encompassing many different countries is very difficult. I know that Europe wants political integrity and peace, so I don't deny the idea of the European countries, but uh, what Abenomics mix could do uh, cannot be done by Euro area now. Because of the political, the di yeah. completely different political environment. Uh, it's a very interesting and, and some, some irony in your question in, in a way, Greg, because um, I would say that the foreign policy makers, particularly in the US, um, learnt the lessons of, of Japan's deflation and quantitative easing, et cetera. Uh, the, the irony being that Japan actually pioneered quantitative easing in 2001, pioneered uh, credit easing in 2002, pioneered forward guidance when they adopted quantitative easing in uh, 2001 as well. But um, they didn't do them very well. And I think the Fed and other central banks learned lessons from that and have applied them. 
Um, and now the Bank of Japan is kind of in a circular fashion learning, as, learning lessons from their pupils in a way. But I think if I just closed on one central lesson from Japan, Greg, uh, which goes to, the, again, the first two arrows, is that you know, if you're trying to get out of deflation, you're trying to prevent a Great Depression, or you're trying to recover from a very, very deep recession in the deleveraging environment, you do need your monetary and your fiscal policies co cooperating with one another. And if you look at the numbers in the US, and stimulus is a dirty word in this country, uh, and if you look at the, the numbers, actually there's been a fiscal drag here for, for quite a while now, and it's been getting worse in the last few quarters. So I think it comes back to that list that Aria, uh, uh, Mohammed mentioned before, and, 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 and Vince Reinhardt, that you know, making sure that everything is on yeah. the list and everything is being tackled in a coordinated fashion. Thanks very much. So I think at a minimum, Japan has shown us a very intriguing path out of the low growth environment that we're in. Whether we actually choose to follow that path is another question, but it's gonna be an interesting experiment to watch. Thank you, Professor Hamada. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you very it's much. It's been a great discussion. Thanks, Greg. All right.